Permaculture really starts with an ethic, earth care, that's care of the whole systems of earth and the species. So we actually devise model systems. Much of the design is drawn from nature. The end result that we aim for is to produce a system that's ecologically sound and economically profitable. It can get as sophisticated or as simple as you like. A city like New York has only one product, it's, it's garbage and feces. And if we sit here, we can watch barge after barge load of fertiliser uh, proceeding to be dumped at sea. And if it was returned to source and used on the land to produce the food for New York, uh, then it would be no pollution. But when we dump it at sea, it wipes out 700 square miles of ocean per year. So you can see the only product in New York is shit and it actually is used to kill parts of the sea. We've built nothing so unsustainable as cities. We can only remedy this if we produce the food consumed by the cities in the cities. And we will start by looking at some of the wastelands and what can be done with them. There's hundreds, probably thousands of acres of wasteland in cities like New York. And depends on the city authorities as to whether these are turned into food for the people of the city or whether those options are closed off. And uh, common sense would dictate that all space now in the city be kept open and given over to people for their own gardens. Oh, sure. Huh? Don't worry. Let the Hey, look at these guys. I left my hat in the air. City authorities don't willingly give up space, so coalitions like the Green Gorillas form to force them to give space for gardens. So there's a considerable voting block in support of this garden at City Hall. The garden was founded by only five Green Gorillas and now 150 families use the garden and it's visited by many other people in the district. Um, this is uh, some of our peppers that are still coming up. We have an um, eggplant over here, a white eggplant. We don't use any pesticides here. Uh, we'll put in, uh, we have praying mantis and ladybugs. Yeah. Um, we do use some BT and stuff like that rather than, you know, using chemicals. Most people would know these as allotments and they are the most productive use of landscape for food in the world and they're what kept European countries alive during wars. Even in a city like New York, there are hundreds and probably thousands of city farms. There was about 1,100 here a year or two back. And uh, so many people are involved in, in part-time farming or production. And also there's a lot of community gardens to which a lot of people have access and which give at least a breathing space in the city. City farms are all built on what everybody else throws away. They all have small recycling centres, all their soil is compost, and they have innovative uses for the other things that people throw away. This is uh, Eric sculpture in New York. It's from Objects Through Bay. And it's very like the Watts Towers uh, down in Los Angeles. It's a great thing to have in any community garden. It's full of interest. There's a million people live in this situation. I met Ray Walden, who was in one of the groups that took over these gardens when it was wasteland and brought in soil to get it going. Ray's an invalid pensioner, but he gets food all year from this garden. I'd say I take a shopping bag of uh, tomatoes and peppers and that sort of thing out at least once a week. We've been uh, we're very fortunate in that. And of course, the thing is that you have something, it's always different, you know, according to the time of the growing season. But we get things as early as in April and, you know, greens and that sort of thing. We're getting uh, crops right through 
Well, we've been here since 83. We've been getting mostly through December. Right about then, we'll get a good killing frost. It'll take it all. And uh, then you collect what's on the vine, and that's the end of that season. But you start early again. You start in February. And, you know, you start eating again in April. <laughs> These little farm blocks are very much more than gardens. They are social and neighbourhood centres. Young mothers come and they have picnics with their children. People come for small parties. And the elderly come here to rest and get away from the city for a while. There are people with wheelchairs and people with a bad arthritis who can't bend down the garden, or people with bad backs. And it's better to raise a bed up like this about top of the thigh. And uh, here's all their fruit and everything at waist level or at wheelchair level. You can, you can build it up like this and fill it with earth. In this case, I had to do that because there isn't any dirt on the ground. And, uh, or you can build this on top of ordinary tables using mulch, just a straw mulch and people can garden in that. So it doesn't matter which way you go about it, but these raised beds are really important to old people. The only rare resource in the city is space, and when we get it, we have to make the most use of it. Well, in urban areas, there are two ways you can stack in more fruit. One is to use dwarf or semi-dwarf fruit trees, and a few of those here, plums and apricots. And the other one is to make a fence out of your fruit trees as an espalier. And underneath the grapes here, there's espalier apples, which just go along like rails. And as they get older, you graft one into the other, and you actually make a, a fence out of apples and pears. So that takes up hardly any room at all for production. So there's several ways you can capitalise on space. Well, in the city farms, and in fact in all urban areas, uh, vertical space is really important. And with vines, you can convert the whole wall into grape production or kiwi production. But the other thing about the vines is that they're active insulators. The hotter it gets, the more they sweat, the cooler the shadow gets inside the vine. And the colder it gets, the more they close down their air systems. So they prevent the entry of 70% of excess summer heat, and they prevent the escape of 40% of your winter uh, warmth. So they're really doing a fine job as insulators on these walls. What's more, with a brick wall in good condition, they'll preserve it about 200 years longer than it would be without vines. Beautiful grapes too. So you can see that, you know, it's, it's not just gardening, it's design, and design for lowering energy inputs. Most city farm can have livestock, but the one most commonly kept is the bee. And if we put the hive above people's heads, then we clear the flight path and hopefully we won't get stung. But all city farms can have bees, and many have other small domestic animals. So this is a rare honey label, pure Manhattan honey. Maybe one day we'll see Sixth Street tacos, and, you know, Fourth Street corn, who knows? Depends on the city. It's springtime in Melbourne, and we're in a city farm called Ceres for a very large number of children. This is the only chance they ever get to handle animals and to find out where milk comes from, all sorts of simple things. That's nice. You're going to take good care. What are you going to feed it on? Vitamins? <laughs> More milk? What else? City farms are primarily community educational centres and the skills taught range from simple things like planting a tree to complex things like designing an energy efficient home. This house is about as typical in its structural form as, as any house around the district and it was moved in here to show how many ways you can 
make inexpensive additions to the house to heat and cool it and to produce the hot water, and that's 80% of energy. It does a little better than that, and as time goes on, it gets a little more efficient. And it's just a few uh, solar additions here and there. In the Western world cities, we're totally accustomed to limitless water and information, and space is uh, not so restricted. But in the third world, space is very restricted, and water is uh, not piped necessarily to your house. So we have to be very careful and innovative about the way we go about gardening. Here we are on Professor Aurora's roof in the city of Hyderabad with his wife, Ira who's made a little garden up here, which provides quite a lot of food, fresh food for them both. We'll go and meet Ira. Hello, Ira. <laughs> your garden's looking very good this mm. year. We were interested in your watering system, which is, oh, yes. I think, the most efficient system, because it wastes the least water of all, I think, in dry areas. Here in the Aurora's rooftop garden, Ira sunk pots and she fills them every few days. They seep out slowly through the unglazed clay and keep all the plants alive in the garden. I think this is the best watering system, really, as far as dry land goes, and as far as saving water, the Malabar spinach. What do you call the Malabar spinach? Pui. Pui. Pui, in Bengali. Yeah, well, that's a shorter name, huh? Yes. And it doesn't need any care at all. No, it's marvellous. It just, when it wants to grow, it will grow all over. And, and here, you, I see we've already, we've got a... Yes, some custard. A custard apple, huh? Yes. And you've had some from the tree. We've eaten uh, about four, four yeah. or five. This is the first season that it's growing. Oh, that's great. Mm. But, I, but I think extends the roof is the tall trees around the edges, you know? Yes. We go and have a look at some of the passion fruit and... Yes. Good. Yeah, well, this, well, this passion fruit has made it right up yes. to the top. Did you do that? No. It came on its own. Yeah, it... How could I do that? <laughs> you never know. No, you don't know where there are one. But there's some ripe ones just down near the yes, window. Yes. Yeah. If we leave the dense situation of Hyderabad, where the rooftops are the logical place to garden, and go to the suburbs of Africa, we'll see that a lot of space is available between houses, both for trees and gardens. In Harare, we have very crowded working people's houses. One of the real problems we get around housing, um, where there's malaria problem, is that with the bath water or the washing water is so rich in, in potash and nutrients that this is an ideal mosquito breeding place. And a couple of years ago, mosquitoes were very bad here. We had problems because they were flying all over and what we decided to do is to build this um, thing to catch the water from the outside tap and the bathroom tap and will lead us to the, this pit which we dug. So what happens, all the water from the tap and the grey water from the bathroom will run into here. So instead of just uh, um, spreading and just uh, being exposed to the, it's being used by the shoe, by the plants to grow. Also, it's, it's, there is well drained, so it percolates into the um, ground. You can see the bananas and sugar canes, and we've grown a lot of different things. Like any good third world city, there's a market just down the road. Every item in these markets is either gathered from the bush or produced in the small gardens around the market or on small farms very close to Harare. That's good. Thank you. Thank you very much. What about you, madam? There's a huge variety of plant and animal materials in this part of the market with the medicine men. Uh, most of the stuff here is for uh, sexual problems or love potions to attract customers, to keep devils away. But there's also some very specific medicines. Uh, use earths, roots, parts of animals, dried parts of animals, preserved parts of animals. All sorts of materials here, you couldn't enumerate them. And no doubt that some people here with very specific knowledge, but 
most people have it for magic, I think. You are in somewhere when you are skin. Yeah, the skin. Yeah, the skin. Skin problems. Yeah, skin problems. Just to squeeze it. Right. This is a squill, and it's uh, very good for skin problems and itching. So this is quite a specific medicine. And in actual fact, not far from the market, it's a very large garden and orchard. There's pawpaws and bananas and mangoes and avocados, a lot of green vegetables. Uh, it's a nice atmosphere. I think people would rather live here in poor houses with lots of food than in the uh, upper class suburb with a lawn, I know I would. So uh, there's a considerable amount of food right through the whole settlements of Harare that aren't following the Western model. Oil, water, soil and food are becoming very uncertain resources in the near future. And we can build them all into human settlements if we want to. Or we can build settlements uh, which take no account of any of these human needs. On one side of the road is a rather bare subdivision and on this side of the road is village homes. Village homes was the first and is probably still the best developed attempt at an ecological village and it's in the city of Davis in the United States. It's really extremely simple but extremely sophisticated at once. It was designed by Michael Corbett. The houses are very close together east-west, they're just uh, maybe 20 feet apart. But each row of houses sit on a rise on either side of a, a hollow. And the hollow is called a swale. It was Mike Corbett who revived that name from the old English. And so all water off the roof, all water off the roads and the paths run into the swales all the year and is absorbed. And I think the figures for the first few years went, we got a foot of water absorbed and then we got about two and a bit feet, I think, and then 17 feet in the third year. So that uh, once you've got 17 feet of water saturation under here, you know you can grow trees without additional watering once their roots are down. So most of these trees um, on the water from the swales. And then many of the trees are food-bearing trees along the little public paths. This is a jujube, which naturally dries on the tree. It's a Chinese date. And this is a good one. Um, and you can store this as long as you like. I've been eating one or two and keeping the pips. But uh, yeah, this is a pretty good one. Here in the uh, settlement, as the trees have grown, the houses have also grown in value. Till now, they're worth five times their original cost. But just over the fence, there are houses that look like the American dream with swimming pools, lawns, dogs and garages. But the owners have to pay energy costs and all their food costs. And so their houses are worth 30% less now than the houses in village homes. Throughout village home, there are strips of public open space and this one's all planted to fruit trees. It's pomegranates and citrus, mulberries and grapes. And there's enough grapes for people to make, for the public to make wine, really, and for the public to eat grapes. So, um, this, this is a high density, you've got to remind yourself all the time here that we're in a high density settlement. And the food is just, uh, really, it's a hand's reach away. So, uh, you know, all the costs of transport are gone, all the costs of wastage is gone. People here can make their own wines, they make their own tacos from the corn, and uh, some people here grow more and sell it. So some, some people here can make their living from growing or preserving food. It just makes a lot of common sense. This place only gets 18 inches of rain, and anybody would classify that as dry. But this town is cool, lush and green. In all western cities, a fortune is spent on stormwater drains to export the clean rainwater out of the settlement. But here the water is soaked into the ground and the money saved is spent on trees. Last year they sold seven tonnes of almonds, for example, and the money goes to maintaining the gardens. 
when I was working in South Melbourne, the city engineer said to me, we were always taught never to plant useful trees in public open space. And he said, and now I wonder why we were taught that. And of course, when you see public open space full of useful trees, we must all wonder why we don't do it, because every city in the world could provide its own food at a very low cost. in Village Homes, I met an old, old friend, David Katz. He and his wife, Karen, and their kids have been here from the very beginning. You can't move from here because the kids don't want to leave. And it's, it's a great neighborhood for kids. Uh, it's nice to have a place where the, uh, there's, there's real neighborhood. There's other people looking after the kids or aware of what's going on. And the kids could go out the door from their wee toddlers on up and, and make their own friends and really control their own life to a great degree that we don't have to you don't have to worry about them and run their life as much and makes it things easier for us and it's a lot better for them it's been really fun because um there's no through traffic and you can play in the streets and there's lots of there's lots of fruit so there's like almost something um something on the trees all all year long so like summer there's peaches and during the fall there's pomegranates and grapes and it's been that's been fun and it's also been fun just to have the like big green fields and being able to go chasing the grapevines and also just being able to ride away and go downtown they know the whole place so much better than we do they know everyone's uh what everyone's backyard is like where their gates are how the windows work and where the uh, uh the secret spots are they play tag for hours, even the big ones do. Um, and no one can find them there. And I, I imagine every kid around here has gotten involved in, in uh, the commerce of the place in terms of the little girls in the neighborhood. There are only five or six, there's three or four that pick little bouquets and uh, pedal them door to door, just uh, for mostly, I think, for the fun of it. And there's just uh, such a cornucopia of fruit and all this other stuff that. I think it's occurred to all of them one time or another to try to do something with it. Uh, they get a real appreciation for it and actually uh, know a ripe fruit from one that's not and, and uh, develop a surprising knowledge about all these kinds of plants and they don't, they're not even aware of it. And, uh, so that's nice too. You know, but the one thing we never really appreciated was the fact of how much freedom we got out of the situation. Um, just like right now. Uh... <laughs> really? This is so extremely uh, beautiful house it's cool there's not much noise gets in there and uh, I have permission to go walk on the roof which is great mm. well this is here I am at the chimney of Jim and Donna's house you know this is the sort of roof I really like it it's always pretty but it never needs painting it's always uh, different colours with the flowers and the foliage. And it's, uh, Donna's down there, but she can't really hear me up here, so it's pretty soundproof. Uh, and I remember this when it was a short herb garden. Now it's looking like a forest, seven years later. Houses here are built to be energy efficient. The whole settlement's built to be energy efficient. Here, the windows to the south, the solar windows, are shaded this time of year both by grapes and by awnings, so we don't get a lot of direct sunlight and heat in when we don't want it. Well, soon it will be winter, and the sun goes low, comes through these windows, and falls on these uh, innocuous blocks, 
which are actually steel tanks, which will be filled with water come the winter, and they'll absorb the heat and radiate it at night into the living area and the kitchen area and out here. So everything's quite passive. In this sort of environment, it's typical for the envelope of the house to merge into the garden almost uh, without any abrupt gradation. So you're sort of inside, partly outside, outside, and, uh, you know, most of the things around us out here are food anyhow. We have a, almost an economic botanical garden here. We have plums, cherries, grapes, peaches, pomegranates, citrus, quinces. Uh, what else? Well, it's just off, and it's, I can see a banana, like passion fruits. Quinces, for instance, you never cook a rabbit without you use a quince. I can see a rhinoceros. <laughs> The village home's a bit of a trap for me. I think I've been here every year since it was built and I wasted thousands of, of films on it because it, it's just the best thing since sliced bread. I, it's the nicest place, I think, in the world for human settlements. <laughs>